It's really how can we make technology as symbiotic to the human experience as possible, right? Where I don't have to actually even look at a thing. I don't have to go look for my phone or look for my iPad, right? I can access the data as soon as I think it, right? That's where it's going. Mm. It's like as soon as I think about something, I should be able to have instant hands-free access to that data. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the Transformative Technology Conference for our second partnership with them. We are now going to be talking about the next OS. We have Andreas Forslin joining us on the show. Hi, Andreas. Hey, Alan. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. On. I'm so <laughs> pumped for this. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just being at your office in Santa Barbara just last month and you showing me your tech demo of the next os and i was like this is what's up and now we're here we yeah. actually get to do the show finally i'm excited i'm so happy to be here and you do you meet some amazing people so i'm i'm glad to be here and uh helping to spread the educational word around what we're trying to do and what's yeah. what's, what's ahead yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I'm so pumped to dive into that with Andreas in a little bit. We love starting things off with asking you some questions about the nature of this reality. Mm. First one is, are we really all one? <laughs> oh, man, that's a that's a great question. Um, are we one? Um, in my mind, uh, we're essentially electric beings right we're, we're we're essentially energy and essentially energy that is separating mass and other elements um and you know i think truthfully yeah we are all one i mean we're a composition of molecules um, and energy and we've sort of assembled our physiological bodies um, to carry our energy um you know i was just having a conversation uh downstairs earlier today with somebody and the question was around um uh when you when you have you ever encountered someone where you felt like you knew them forever like mm. the first time and we there were a number of people i met today where i had that kind of moment where <clears throat> it really felt like we've known each other forever like and had never met before um and i think there's something there that's hard to explain yeah yeah and then the next question that i like asking after this is do you have feelings of deep profound interconnectedness or ego death or unconditional mm. love or hyper present moment or like tell us about these experiences maybe that you've had um I've had them, but they come in moments, right? You have this sort of phase shifting that happens um, where you really collapse into yourself, right? And then there's other times where you feel completely dematerialized and you feel like you're intertwined with the ones around you, you know? And I think it's, um, it's an interesting state of how you break that down and, and how you can try and make sense of it. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with my experience of feeling sort of a oneness uh, is in communication, right? Yes. So um, it's yes. not just sitting next to someone and being proximate to their bodies and having physical proximity to each other, but actually in the communication, um, not even the shared language, right? But it's my ability to, uh, or your ability to um, move molecules from your body in such a way yes. that I... I feel welcomed, I feel a part of your energy, right? And, and so um, I encounter a number of people who they, they speak um, in a very one directional way and it's very rough, right? It's a rough yeah. slap shot way of communication yeah, yeah, and you yeah. don't feel so much like a oneness in that communication. But then if you're communicating or you're being communicated to um, with a, 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 a caring sense, a sense of care, uh, and a sense of receipt, like how do you receipt, receive my communication? Um, those who can deliver communication in a way that has the other feel like they're being thoughtfully, you know, you're thinking through the reception of it. Um, I think that's where you really have these bonds. And so 
yeah, I think communication and thinking about how we operate as humans um, and how technology might be able to help us yes, yes, connect yes. at a much more visceral level, yes, yes. Um, even if you don't speak the same language. Yes, I, I love this. Uh, it takes us up to a, like a, a, ma a macro view of um, literally the words that you say right now are directly making an imprint in my physiology, period. There's just no mm. way around it. I'm becoming changed every moment that I listen to your words. Mm. And so there is a very serious interconnected relationship between us and there's a very serious interconnected relationship between the air that you're breathing mm -hmm. uh, the water you're drinking the food that you're eating between the sun giving that energy mm. between phytoplankton and trees giving you the air that you're mm. breathing in you know mm. i mean it's just endless the amount of interconnectedness mm. but we need to augment our perception to see that interconnectedness mm. we need to train our faculties of awareness to see and feel the deep embodied states of those and not just like the intellectual masturbated versions but the actual felt experiences of those and then if you can do something even deeper like try and do some like fmri or eeg or ekg or just some sort of a biometric analysis of what's going on during those interconnected states then you can prove potentially when people are actually in those states or mm. not mm -hmm. and then you can get billionaires and government leaders and corporate leaders and even grassroots people to be tested on that kind of stuff yeah yeah well yeah and thinking about um how people are uh radiating right how they're radiating their energy or how they're expressing like i use the words just expression right so you can express yourself in words you can express yourself with dance with movement with just simply your the emptiness or the pause right so the uncomfortable pause in speech. Yeah. You can have the pause in body movement and presence and the ability to be aware of how you are in such a way to create a dynamic, right? Yeah. Um, and so like you're saying, like these things um, uh, come, uh, they have a lot to do with self-reflection and, and understanding oneself and also observing others and learning yes, and yeah. constantly learning from other people. Um, but what's also interesting, and because we're at a trans tech conference, uh, uh, understanding the science, right? There's the there's yes. the human, there's the science around the human, which is what 99% of what is going on here is around understanding the science of humanity um, and how um, transformative technology can be for humanity. But you were talking about, you know, the ability to sense things, right, that are beyond our own explanation and 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 you know you look at things like bats or you look at fish and dolphins and animals and other kinds of mammals and creatures and and they all have their own kinds of senses right and and so the ability to understand that for instance our eyes are constrained like we have an immense amount of data coming through as yes. an input through our eyes like and we're our eyes parsing for what's most salient for what's most salient but there's a there's an entire band of light that yeah. we can't even see right with our own eyes yeah. now you can augment our eyes to enhance the spectral yes. range and depth yes. of yes. things yes. which is a way of augmenting things of color it's, and it's like mapping. snakes see infrared mm -hmm. Uh, like bats use ultrasound. Yeah, use well dolphins and things dolphins like echolocation, echolocation. And things like this. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You have birds use um, like there's a there's folks that are using magnetometers for defining true north and doing body hacking, like That's installing crazy. haptic sensors on wow. their bodies so that you know I could at any given get time know which direction. <laughs> yeah, like the vibration is, kind yeah. of goes a little faster, a little slower, and you know when you first experience it it feels awkward right but then all of a sudden the plasticity of your mind your mind starts to just forget that that enhancement is there and yeah, your brain yeah. remaps yes, yes, and it just becomes yes, a, a an extra sense exactly and so there's a lot of the brain adapts just like that the brain is extremely pliable yeah right it's extremely plastic in the sense of we as humans um don't you know as adults i should say children are always sensing yeah, right they're yeah. just putting their hands in their mouths and touching yeah. things and smelling things and really embracing the full sensual uh discovery process that discovery journey that journey of understanding what you can sense and so on but then as adults we stop really 
exploring the possibilities beyond what's right in our face, right? And 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 so what we're really looking at, and we the this community and people like yourself and myself mm-hmm. are really looking at how can we truly enhance the human experience um, in such a way that isn't just to do it. Like we're not just trying to enhance the human experience. We're trying to enhance it in a way that brings a whole nother level of capability to the human performance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, um, you know, how do you look at individuals uh, that might be neurotypical, you know, or average or even high performers? And how do you enhance, uh, say, take someone from good to great? Uh, there's a lot of work being done in those areas f- um, for, you know, biohacking, neurohacking, all kinds of things about getting increased performance, quantitative self, all this stuff is all around augmentation. You're augmenting your diet. You're yeah. augmenting the, you know, the oxygen you breathe. You're augmenting the water you're taking into your system. You're, yeah. you're augmenting yeah. your circuit, you know, everything. Your vascular system's getting augmented. And we're doing it through nutrition or through high-tech or low-tech solutions, right? Um, and, and, and so there's a lot of work going on there. But then there's also the other end of the spectrum. So if you look at it from a, <clears throat> there's a zero point and you're going from, you know, sort of a deficit or, or, or a positive. Uh, a lot of us are sort of on the positive side. We're sort of taking a positive and making it even more positive. But there's a number of folks who have certain physical disabilities that it's all about restoration, right? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> not to sort of steal the company's name, yeah. Restoration Hardware, but it's kind of like a lot of what we're doing is like how do we hack um, and develop um, sensitive you know uh, sensory solutions that can augment uh individuals bodies and physical uh, augmentation as well as uh, cognitive augmentation um, to restore capabilities or perhaps even create an extra sense or an extra capability that was never there before yes damn yeah that entire sense explosion is so fascinating um yeah you can gain back the sense that may not have um, developed or you may endeavor into brand new senses and just train that plasticity of the brain to adapt to that. Um, There's a tremendous amount of advancements that are happening here with brain computer interface and micro reality that we're all that we're going to dive into and talk about. I really, really, really want um, to hear your thoughts on this. Like as we dive into the next OS, I want to hear your thoughts on this because we're talking about it from such an interconnected perspective that everything is so interconnected could it be that all of the downstream issues that we have in our world are due to the upstream issue of us feeling the illusion of separation Mm. um i i i do see it's 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 kind of funny there's there's a uh I kind of draw I draw a little bit of a analogy over to like uh, economic terms like creative destruction right and so what's interesting is you have these times of great consolidation and then you have these times of great disruption right um, and those things get reconciled so think of it as a pendulum swinging and so the same thing is happening in industries where people are afraid of advanced technologies because they say oh it's going to take away jobs or it's going to it's going to do this or it's going to do that and and maybe it does but most often uh these new innovations which are initially perceived as threats end up creating more prosperity and more access and more abilities than if we had just stayed where we were so there's an as long argument. as we're ethical and as long moral. as there's ethical yeah. and you you know to some degree you you make sure that there's a, a way of handling the change at a societal level right so i mean we're not talking about body hacking but you think about you know self-driving i've just been thinking about this on the way up here was like self-driving um semi trucks right and and what's going to happen to um all of the people who are all the over the road truck drivers right and you know that's a huge disruption right and it's coming um and but the uh, how does that get throttled so to speak in such a way that enables the livelihood to continue or even prosper for people that that's their livelihood 
you know, and you see that in lots of different industries, um, whether it's accounting and taxes or you're talking about healthcare and medical yeah, stuff, yeah. right? Is um, it the most upstream issue our illusion of separation is causing all of the downstream issues? The illusion of separation. Um, or lack of interconnectedness. Well, I think I, the point that I was trying to get yes, to yes, was good. on yes. this was, okay. thanks for bringing me back to that, yes, was yes. Um, um, the for instance, social media, right? Social media was to bring us closer together, but the paradox is it, in yeah. many ways, has created more isolation. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's a bit of an interesting thing. It's like, is it actually creating isolation? Is like social media creating more isolated people because there's now a screen between us, right? Or is it actually just like herpes? Like, you know, everybody has herpes, but, but it, it takes something environmental or some other trigger to cause it to flare up. So is every human being just engineered to be super depressive and super isolated in general? And uh, many people have to work to be social, right? There's a lot of introverts. I myself is one, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are introverted who have to work very, very hard to be social, you know? And they want to feel connected, but they still they still uh, sort of love and cherish their independence and their isolation, you know? So mm -hmm. it's this interesting sort of paradox. But <clears throat> so is the illusion of, of, you know, I think you said it's like, is the illusion of us being together or, or separated? Yeah. You know, I think it's, um, it's, it's not an illusion. I think it's um, the technology that we've created has uh, unintended consequences. There, that, I think that's the key uh, around technology in social engineering, technology in uh, lifestyle design, technology in augmentation is being mindful of the uh, unintended consequences. Uh, and you may still proceed and say, we're going to embrace those unintended consequences because there's lots of stuff we don't know. And if we don't embrace it, then we don't know what we're dealing with. So you have to push forward in many ways. But if you are absent minded and you are just going into yes, something, yes, yes, yes. Um, you may problems, cause problems. huge problems. It, it seems like the more upstream we go with diving deep into our feelings of interconnectedness, our feelings of, of, of deep amounts of of unconditional love for each other of 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 uh um present moment awareness with each other the more that we are aware of that those feelings on a moment to moment basis mm. the less likely we are to have downstream issues of ethical slips or moral slips or all of these potential issues but okay that was that was that bit Let's get on to mm. this. Yeah, because this is a huge like you, downstream. Here we are, augmented humans, right? We're talking about this. Everyone's wondering, you know, if the per right now, who owns the data? This is mm. a big one. Right now, another one, who owns the substrate? If mm. I'm literally going to be entering these VR environments and AR environments, you guys own the substrate. So mm. what? Who, so you guys get to do whatever you want with the environment that i enter into if it becomes that popular which it totally looks like people want to play gods mm. in these in these worlds where they can manipulate bits instead of atoms you know and mm. okay so the question then as we get into this augmented uh age of all of our faculties of awareness is then you know, you guys at Cognition are focusing on a very, very, very ethically grounded mission statement. And this mm. is personally what I would love to see out of more companies. The mm. companies are not starting from that first principle. Mm. This is what, when, when, like the demo that you're about to show, this idea of the next OS being first and foremost built for people that are having issues um, with speech and motor impairment that, that, that are able to creatively flourish because of technology that you make for them. And then those augmentations can then be then applied to even more people in unique ways that we don't in, in like you said, senses that we don't even have yet. Mm -hmm. I'm loving this. Mm. This is stuff I'm loving. All the creative potential being released, unleashed. Yeah. Mm. And that's exactly what it is, right? It's, it's, I think, um, what the oneness I think that most people share is, is, uh, we all have a shared 
desire, right? Some people don't want to be loved. Some people do want to be loved. Some people love is not the most important thing, right? To be understood is more fundamental than being loved, right? So being understood, not even accepted, but be understood, right? Because ultimately to be understood means that there's integrity and you can build integrity you can build on integrity, right? Mm-hmm. So if, if I'm doing something and you understand it correctly, you can respond to it, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And whether that's you as a human responding to me on a request level, or whether it's a robot responding to me, or whether it's you know software responding to me, it's about building a, a foundation of integrity um, and making sure that there's a, like if you think about, you know, I'm recognizing something and I'm classifying it correctly, (laughs) right? I'm speaking to you, you're recognizing it, you're classifying it, you're then responding back to me. It's an actuated, this is a closed loop. Like what we're doing is machine learning over and over and over again, right? And so that's all this is, is we are humans, are meaning making machines, and essentially we're making inferences and meaning of all of the shit that's coming in and around me, and we're responding to that yes. with our scenario planning and exactly. best judgments, right? Yes, and yes, so you think yes. about just individual decision making, group decision making, factoring multiple inputs from a variety of contextual yes. data points, and being able to synthesize that into an action an action right and so how do we recreate that right how do we augment someone if someone has a sensory deficit yeah how do we restore or replace or you know substitute that sensory deficit you know it's it's another data point it's context awareness so how can you have more context awareness so that if i use an example where you know, somebody may not have behavior, situational awareness. You know, so you might have, say, uh, a child with autism. You might have a teenager with autism, and you're on the playground at school, and uh, cognitively and literacy levels they're off the charts. Um, behaviorally, um, they aren't able to key off of any kind of prompts or clues. So they need a secondary prompt to. Uh, inform them that hey by the way respond look at look at look at your friend's eyes uh, make eye contact so some a child might need to get a bit of a nudge or they might engineer a prompt in order for that in child to realize oh i need to make eye contact with you while i'm talking right that can be done with a human as an aid or it could actually you could replace the human is there an alternative technological way yeah, to have yeah. a contextually aware prompt that yeah, that yeah triggers me to make eye contact so that I can then start to get that reinforcement learning to say when I interact with you I now need to make eye contact does that need to be a a, a human that's paid tens of thousands of dollars to to nudge me along or can that be technology can I have more agency over my life and my development as a human being Um, and can technology somehow help shore that up so that I have that agency and I'm not dependent on other humans to feel one does not mean to feel dependent to feel one means that you should have as much agency as you can have and that you feel as close to being on a level playing field as those around you right that you may not be able to do certain things as good as the other person but there's probably some things you can do that's way better than the other person Mm -hmm. right and the ability to be able to you know have those kinds of relationships that's a trust that's integrity um and so you really, I see how you can create social transformation, cultural transformation, economic transformation in the world by addressing the root cause, which is communication. And underneath communication is very simply, can we create a platform for being understood? Interesting that that's where you go with it. I, I'm, I'm so interested in that first principle of yours. So communication is about being understood. And so the augmentation of communication augments the amount of people that feel understood. And then by also, as you go into figuring out how to augment this communication, you have to do things like figure out how to 
do something as complex as having a when you have a speech or motor impairment how do you actually build something that is extremely user experience friendly that gets people to love the experience of having one of their senses augmented mm. and then you can provide that as a yeah. beautiful service to people yeah you know it's it's um well so so i've been in design for like 25 years so my background is user experience design um so i kind of go way back um, and most of my experience has been in natural user interfaces so dealing with how do you use technology in a way that maybe wasn't meant or wasn't designed to do it that way um you know, in, in, in how do you create uh, that user experience where somebody um, has a viscerally positive experience, like right away, um, there's marketing terms called like time to value, TTV. And so <clears throat> the whole goal of developing a delightful user experience where someone not only likes it, they but they fall in love with it. Um, and it becomes a bit ritualistic is that you're continually um, you can deliver uh, the value proposition as fast as possible so they have that aha moment um, that you can meet or exceed or deliver a part of the experience in a way that they didn't expect right surprise yeah. it's not just delight but it's surprise and delight um, and so for instance um, you know, being able to pick up a device and without having to do anything. You know, Apple does this really well. They, they started out like with the Touch ID, being able to unlock the phone with your, with your fingerprint. And then now being able to unlock it with your face, you know, uh, with Face ID. These are things that are extremely delightful in the sense of, wow, you're ju you just took away a whole bunch of mechanical steps that I have to take. And you're now making it possible for the technology to adapt to me and shortcut a whole bunch of manual steps so that I'm more productive, I'm higher capacity, I feel more powerful as a human because I can get to what I want to do. You're eliminating the time it takes for me to have yes, the value. Yes, yes, yes. Like, so if I pick up my smartphone and I am thinking, oh, I need to go look at a PDF file in my email, right? because somebody's calling me about it, right? How long does it take for me to get to that PDF file in my phone? Like yeah. for my phone, I have to pick up the phone and clock it in milliseconds, right? It's like, how long does it take for me to cognitively think, okay, I need to get that PDF. I need to look at it. There's a specific phrase or clause in that contract in that PDF that they want me to look at. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, where am I gonna get it? Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, and so, the I, data have to, I have to think. So I have to, I have to, to, think, I have to un, mentally. Like, it's, it's unstructured, and we want to. We want to structure that data. Right, but in your yeah. mind, you're you're actually to get to the PDF. You are actually getting the PDF like a dozen times. You're actually to get to the PDF. You're getting it like a dozen times. You are mentally. You've already cognitively gotten the PDF. You went looking for it in your mind. What are the steps that would t I would need to do to go get the PDF before you even pick up the device? Then you pick up the device and you're like, oh, I have to enter these keys and all this stuff to get in to get it, unlock the phone. Then I have to swip and find the app. Then I find the app and I have to go and look in my inbox. And then I have to do a search and I have to drill down and I have to f figure out like, oh, I'm looking for the paper clip. My gosh, this OS <laughs> is so archaic. And then you go down to the operator and you're like, oh, there's the is that the right is that the right one? Um, oh, that is the right PDF. Okay, launch it. I preview it. I have to scroll it, zoom, pinch and zoom to get in. And then now I have to read it. So your elapsed time on that, I've, I've mentally gone through, it's so heavy, right? Like the cognitive load <clears throat> to go get a PDF out of your email. Like I'm not in the email redesign business, but that's just an example, right? There's companies that are trying to solve that problem. But the point of the matter is technology now with things like the ability to do face ID or touch ID has just eliminated so much cognitive load for me to get in and start accomplishing the things I want to do, right? Um, so those types of technologies were designed for security and authentication. Well, we look at that as, as a great opportunity. It's like, well, can we use some of those same technologies to provide uh, a control interface 
<laughs> right? Uh, can can we start to observe um, your biometric data um, in yeah. such a way to understand at 60 frames a second what your emotional state is and those minute micro shifts in emotional facial recognition and you know expressive qualities yeah. um, that could be semantically analyzed? Um, can we understand you better and your mental state and your emotional state um, as it relates to how you're accessing certain stuff? And then can we actually use the same onboard sensors to, to allow you without using your hands at all? Like I can just literally look at the device and unlock it and I can go to the apps and open the app and I can start talking or start moving stuff around and not lift a finger. And, and some might say, well, that's you're causing obesity problems if all of a sudden you're letting people just sort of sit on their asses on the sofa and just have their iPad or something on the, you know, on the coffee table. And it's like, oh, I'm just going to do this stuff remotely. But how powerful is that? That now technology, you know, I don't have to sit here and like pull out the keyboard and type stuff in and use the mouse and do all this stuff. It's not about smart people using dumb devices to enter data into into systems yeah. anymore. Right. It's smart systems that are starting to adapt and learn and respond to me. And so we sort of I see this future where technology is going to be much, much more sensitive. Like if you can design love and empathy as a part of the underlying values and principles of how your software operates. Right. Like how do you actually humanize the AI? right you can give it humanistic qualities you can also give it a set of values right um you can so whether those values depends on where those values come from right but it has a lot to do with your underlying philosophy of how you're designing technology and you can either design technology to make machines smarter or you can design technology to make machines adapt and support humans and i think that's the philosophical frame that we think is where things need to go um, and when we say augmentation it's not just about offloading loads and loads of data to the cloud and processing stuff over 5g it's really how can we make technology as symbiotic to the human experience as possible right where i don't have to actually even look at a thing i don't have to go look for my phone or look for my ipad right i can access the data as soon as i think it right that's where it's going Mm. is like as soon as i think about something i should be able to have instant hands-free access to that data yeah and then be able to uh, take something like whatever your unique blueprint is that you have to bring some sort of a gift to the world you can then take and visualize this most concrete data around that unique gift or blueprint that you're bringing to the world and then make actions on it and then when you get step by step closer help thanks to also augmentation technologies it makes it so that all of the things that we're building this future why are we building it is actually going towards a benevolent loving ethical purpose so I so would, long as it's yeah. stewarded the right way with so long as the right leaders and technology and the right ethicists and the right people are uh, you know things can get out of hand you know um so i think you need to have the right yeah, you have to have the right philosophical perspective and how you're embedding and designing. Yeah. Some of the most important things that I've been learning from you about people that have speech and motor impairments are just the stories that you've been telling me about your ability to restore their senses and augment their augment their senses and bring them back to an ability to communicate and creatively flourish. I love these mm. stories. So hit us with these stories and then we'll talk about how the tech works. Yeah, so, um, you know, well, there's a couple stories of, like, folks who didn't have our technology, right? And you can see why they would need it. Um, and so, like, one story that uh, we learned about was uh, this, this gentleman, he had uh, um, uh, cerebral palsy, and he was in a wheelchair. So, so really fully immobilized in a, in a wheelchair, and he was being transported 90 miles to the next city. So this was in Santa Barbara. He was being shuttled up to um, Pismo Beach. Um, And when they were loading him into the van, uh, everything was normal, like every time they load him in. Uh, And then as soon as uh, they started to um, get going, uh, everything seemed normal. And then they arrived 90 minutes later in Pismo. They open up the door. 
clash. And then they, they're like, why is, why is this guy all sweaty and red and just looking like he's about to die? Like, what's wrong with this guy and what happened over the last 90 minutes? And they were trying to figure out what's going on with this guy. And then literally like a while later, they realized that they had actually clipped his belly with the seat belt and he rode 90 minutes with his flesh pinched in a seat belt and he had no access to speech like he couldn't say ouch yeah, yeah he couldn't say hey guys like stop you know so so imagine not being able to speak when you have something like that that's a it's an accident nobody meant to do it yeah um but you're like wow you know, imagine like the breakdowns of not having communication, you know. Um, but on the upside, you know, we have other folks who uh, are using our technology. Like there's a guy uh, that we've learned about that he's a DJ, right? He's a DJ. He's in a motorized wheelchair. Um, he is such an awesome personality. I mean, an amazing amazing human being and he DJs he DJed for the Special Olympics in in the LA I guess the Coliseum and stuff and he's gigging and doing all this kind of stuff he's living his life charging hard um, and he 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 gets around he does his thing but so one of the frustrations he had is like when he's DJing and people come up and they're like hey can you play whatever song right or can you do this or can you do that and he's like dude I can't <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk to you. So we hooked him up with uh, a mounting bracket and an iPad running a speech application that we made called Speak Pros. And we're using our embedded eye tracking and facial recognition. And he'd plug that thing up to his soundboard. And now he's DJing, partying. And anytime he needs to talk to somebody over his sound system, yeah, yeah. he just literally like looks over, glances, and blinks, and it says what he needs to say. He's essentially created a bionic third arm that's a natural extension. So you might even call it an, a, like a neuroprosthesis. You might even call it just a phantom limb. It's a third appendage, right? But it's an extra capability. So yeah. on one hand, you have individuals who might need stuff like this uh, augmentation just for, for, for basic core functional living life, right? And dealing with the basic stuff. Then you have the other situations where people, they can completely set their creative direction for their life. They can totally set sail and go where they want to go, right? And it's not just about communication. You know, like what we're doing is, you know, you know with like things like AI assistants, like Siri and, you know, Katana and Alexa, these things. Um, and, you know, now you can control stuff, right? So it's not just like, hey, I want to talk to you. It's, hey, I want to turn on the lights. Hey, I want to change the music station. Hey, I want to order some Kung Pao chicken, you know? Um, you know, so, so now uh, through natural language understanding and natural language systems, right? NLP, NLU, um, building AI agents on the back end, we've created a user interface that's core, which is a communications interface that not only allows people to speak but they can also control their world and their destiny, right? So imagine like, okay, you're my full-time caregiver and I'm gonna tell you what I want. Well, I could just do that myself. Like, I don't need to say like, type out something on my eye tracking keyboard and say, could you turn the lights on? I can just say, lights on, right? <laughs> you know, like, I don't need you to, I don't need to say, hey, Julie or whoever, you know, come, come help me out. It's like, change the station. Right. Um, you know, imagine being able to turn on a, a Roomba, like, you know, clean up my mess. And then your mess is attached to a skill that tells your Roomba to come out and vacuum up the popcorn on the floor. <laughs> you know, um, you now have all this agency and you can do it hands free with your eyes and your face. You know, like this is the future where you say, wow, this is a transformation for lots and lots of people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that's accessible today. You know, you think about Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is amazing. You know, so much creativity and so much knowledge sort of bottled up inside of a vessel, right? Like, Stephen Hawking's amazing, but there's millions of other people that are amazing too that didn't have the resources that he had, you know? So he had wonderful... Um, partners, you know, Intel and others that, that worked around with Stephen Hawking to help provide his early technology, you know. Um, 
the universities and grants and everybody rallied around Stephen. But here you have literally millions of other people, child, including children and, and older people, um, who have lots to say and do. Like we have people that use our technology now that are they're artists and we have individuals who literally have a quarter of a million followers on YouTube who want to become nonverbal talk show hosts. Imagine like yeah. individuals with autism that are going to become nonverbal talk show hosts. Um, you started to see, I think, um, uh, in the highest orders of government in Japan, they now have two people with severe disabilities that are holding court in Japan. You know, you're starting to see a world that because of these augmentations, because of these accessible technologies, who knows what kind of ideas are going to come from these corners that have been otherwise overlooked. Yes, I want you to show us the um, this new input-output Mm. This new OS. Mm. Let's do a demo. Yeah, so um, most people that are using this kind of technology, uh, what we've created, essentially we've got an app that's running, it's loaded onto an iPad Pro, um, and we're analyzing your face and your eyes. Um, so if you look at these, they're marked red because they're not looking at my eyes yet. My, my connection is broken. So it's a biofeedback mechanism that allows for forgiveness in the system, right? That I'm not going to be stressed out and frustrated if things aren't behaving the way I want because it's giving me that indication that, oh, something's out of alignment. So I can level set and be not so stressed out. Um, you know, but also if I do this and I get closer, the eyes get bigger or further away. So for me to get this calibrated or not even calibrated, but just comfortably positioned, uh, I get that biofeedback straight away. But normally somebody that might have a disability, say with ALS or multiple sclerosis or cerebral palsy or something like that, or a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, um, they might have this iPad on a mount and the mount has actually got a bracket that's connected to say a wheelchair. Um, so that this is in a fixed position so that they can access it any time. Uh, so essentially what I'm doing here, and I, you can see that I didn't do any calibration. All I'm doing is just holding it and instantly I can, I can access and I can say thanks, right? I can, thanks. I can talk to you, right? I can, I can say yes. yes. I can ask you questions like, I don't know, what's your name? So I can come up in here and say like, I'm, oh, look. What's your name? All right. I can start to have conversations. What's your name? I can start to have conversations in an augmentative way. If I wanted to do something like go outside, I might say, oh, I want to go. Oh, I want to go outside. Just eye tracking is doing this. Yeah, this is my eyes. I'm not touching anything. I want to go outside now. And I want to be really nice about it, so I'm going to say please. Or no, I'm actually going to say I want to go outside now with you. Right, so now I can come in here and start to have a conversation. I want to go outside now with you. So if that's, that's like structured functional communication, but if I wanted to kind of go totally unstructured, right, I, we've got integrated keyboards, right? So I could be like, oh man, I can actually drive this whole thing with my face. Right? I'm just literally just like, wow, that's really awesome. Keyboard's hard. But it still works. Really awesome. Right, so the ability to access this, right? So the next best alternative for something like this, you're talking about twenty or $30,000 for solutions that are in the market today. Versus an iPad. Versus what we're doing, we make the software available. If you've already got the iPad, you can DIY it and you can get it yourself if you're technically savvy. Um, a lot of people like to rely on insurance to pay for these kinds of solutions. So we just got approved this November um, to start uh, providing this as a solution uh, through insurance. So, you know, now more and more people are going to be able to access these kinds of capabilities. So this is just the beginning of what's possible, right, for augmenting someone's abilities. You were asking earlier, right, about user experience 
and how to you know how to how to get to time to value for the end user. But the interesting thing is when you're developing things like bionic augmentations, like this might be considered a bionic augmentation, right? Um, uh, for someone with a disability, you're not only designing it for them, right? You're augmenting their capacity, their capabilities, but you also have to design it for their loved ones, right? Or whomever's around them. So you have a full 360 that you've got to really take into consideration. Um, and usually what we've learned is anytime you're doing augmentative technologies, um, if the person who is the primary caregiver or the person who spends the most time with the individual, if they don't understand how to use it and they don't know how to admin it, they're not tech savvy and most people aren't, uh, if it's not designed to be really, really simple right out of the box, it's not going to get used. So like millions and millions of dollars are being spent on assistive technologies today that end up going in the drawer, not because the end user doesn't need it or can't use it. It's because the person that they rely on, yeah. it's too complicated, too complicated. It's too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really, really critical for anyone, anyone in the industry developing technology they need to be very sensitive to spending time to really try and simplify things as much as they can understanding that everybody isn't just like you right like you might tolerate complex user interfaces most people can't most yeah, people yeah. don't and if your goal if your value proposition is to create a lasting effect for augmenting someone's abilities that means that they're going to basically be relying on the technology every single day right and if they're going to rely on it every single day then it needs to be really easy for them to learn right and that's where software like ai comes in right it's like well there's a certain amount of a learning curve that comes from the user but then there's a certain amount that comes from the system so if you think about like i don't play the piano but man if i could kind of start to learn the, to play the piano and then the piano started to learn me and met me in the middle i wonder what kind of music i could play right any all kinds of bionic systems are just like learning to play a musical instrument yeah you're developing a new skill you're learning to do new things with your body in different ways whether that's physically or with your mind um and so the ability to mentally control stuff right either with your eyes your face or even directly with your brain as a brain interface right these are new skills that we need to learn but we also need to have the technology yeah. learn us so that it makes the learning curve faster and easier right that someone feels like just the way i demonstrated that i just literally picked up the ipad and i easy? just started using yes, it yes i didn't have to read a menu it just learned me yes and yes. it just started doing what i needed it to do yeah. That's how you develop a bionic capability.